Hi, it's Mike with Youtastic. I'm here again at GoToConf 2014, and I'm sitting here with Michael Nygaard, who gave a talk on DevOps at 5. Where are we now? Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about DevOps at 5? What does that, what does that mean, and, and how did you come to that presentation? Sure, I'd be happy to. So DevOps uh, was actually coined by one individual. Mm -hmm. We know when the name was created. Uh, it was created by Patrick <laughs> Dubois uh, in 2009. Okay. So that was five years ago. And five years is an interesting time span. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's a round number, and humans like round numbers. Yeah. But it's also sort of the time it takes any idea to go from radical to kind of entering the mainstream. It's about half the time it takes for an idea to become completely mainstream. Mm -hmm. And it's about one quarter of a normal career for a, a working programmer, mm -hmm. or the what you would call the time from entering the field to being a uh, grizzled gray beard type. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, five years was an interesting time to sort of take stock, collect up many of the ideas that people have created, um, uh, sort of provide a survey for folks who haven't been in it right. for that time, but maybe are hearing the term, are interested in what it's about, and frankly, also to uh, give some cautions or some warnings. Right. Uh, and so I wanted to do all of that in kind of one 50-minute package. Yeah. Uh, and that was my talk. And I have to say, when, when I heard five, I was thinking more of, like, the volume that it's starting to get to the point where people are talking about DevOps more. And that's been kind of a theme a little bit here at GoToConf is about lean and uh, lean enterprises and, and continuous delivery and taking this term DevOps and saying, no, this is really something that we really need to think about. Yeah, definitely. And, and we heard that theme echoed by Adrian Cockcroft in his uh, uh, keynote that opened the conference, where he talked about the, uh, the trajectory at Netflix from 2009, where people were saying, no, it'll never work, to somewhere around 2012, they say it only works for special unicorns like Netflix. Right. To 2014, where you know a lot of companies Probably are saying, <laughs> "Yeah, we need to do this too," um, and, one, and that's definitely how DevOps has gone as well. It's gone from this idea that says, "Well, it's fine for web native companies like mm -hmm. Flickr and Etsy, but it doesn't do me any good in my you know retail organization. Right. I've got brick and mortar stores to worry about." Uh, but as time has gone on, we've seen that the ideas are quite generally applicable. Right. In an earlier interview, we talked with somebody who talked about how they were using continuous delivery, uh, working with the restaurant industry and able to deliver a change 10 hours before opening of, of, a, of a major bar. And mm -hmm. uh, that these, these concepts can be applied into serious product development that actually really touches an end user and what might have previously been considered a, oh my God, we're in a freeze mode don't touch anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, when you look at the reason for freezes and, and uh, the uh, sort of traditional deployment process, mm -hmm. a lot of it is around risk management. The idea of saying uh, an event, a negative event, has a high cost, and so we need to avoid that cost. Right. I would turn that around these days and say preventing that event also has a cost. It's not as visible in the immediate sense, mm -hmm. but it's a cost that you feel in the form of friction and delay in getting things done. Right. And so we've changed to a different style of risk management that says, uh, I'm going to try and reduce the chance of a bug slipping through to production, but I'm also going to make sure that I detect it immediately and can push a new release that uh, eliminates the bug right. immediately. Uh, and so... Uh, in some sense, the number of opportunities for error goes way up, but the cost of any individual error goes way down because you're limiting the scope. So is it trying to turn what is previously known as a risk period? Like once we get into a certain period before it goes live, we, we have code freeze, to change is now not a risk. It's just part of the way we approach the well, I'm a little cautious about that because there still is some risk associated with it. And if, if you do, if you don't adopt any of the other practices and you just go to fast deployments, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to uh, incur some damage. Okay. It, as you speed up the deployments, you also need to speed up your monitoring and mm -hmm. your metrics. You need to make sure that you can detect a problem very quickly. So focus on that uh, mean time to detection. I've been in many places where the mean time to detection is measured in weeks. 
it needs to be seconds yeah. uh, to really say you're doing uh, the DevOps continuous delivery approach. Uh, and likewise, you need to be able to repair the damage very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian talked about uh, detecting uh, a bad deployment within mm -hmm. five seconds of when it goes live right. and automatically switching back over to the old system that's still live and running. Uh, so in that case, you say a 10 second error, how many users are gonna hit that 10 second error? Right. So, so you, again, I'm, I'm I, trying to put it in into uh, dollar cost terms where I'm comparing the expected losses from bugs slipping through to production mm -hmm. versus the expected losses of bugs that are already in production that you can't fix because you're in a freeze. Yeah, so it's it, to me, it almost sounds like you're trying to say we're gonna reduce that surface area of that first group that hits a new change mm -hmm. and then let once we know because we've, we've kept it that surface area small we can grow it out and then but be able to retract absolutely much more quickly. i think of, i think of limiting it in space and time so limiting the uh, exposure in space is uh how broadly is my audience exposed to the new code right away mm -hmm. So we use techniques like feature flags and differential routing to let a few people in at a time. Um, and then uh, limiting the scope in time is how quickly can I fix the bug when right. it gets through. Right, so yeah, so how, how the, the speed of, of, or even being able to turn it off, because like when you describe yes, the feature exactly. flag is, oh, that one didn't work. So that could be that instantaneous Absolutely. Uh, mitigation of, of risk. Mm -hmm. um, so the term DevOps though, it's still been kind of a high-level term, and it, we've talked a little bit about monitoring and, and continuous delivery. What, what When you say the term DevOps, so can you kind of break that down into kind of pieces a little bit more? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Um, actually, the schema that I would use comes from John Willis, <laughs> who talked about DevOps as culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. Okay. Um, and culture comes first for a good reason. So the idea with culture is that we want to create a high trust culture where we have uh, strong and deep collaboration between development and operations. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why, by the way, I consider it a fallacy to hire a new DevOps team that sits between dev okay. and ops and is supposed to be a bridge. Because uh, instead of creating a, a tight junction, what you've right. really done is now made two handoffs instead of just one. Yeah, and they're they're alien, and now there's friction. Yeah, that's absolutely. Been and both sides feel threatened by this new team. Um, so the culture is one of enablement and mutual support. Mm -hmm. So where previously um, uh, operations was frequently held accountable for code they didn't write right. and the availability and performance of said code. Um, now we would close that feedback loop and say operations is going to enable development to move things into production as rapidly as possible and also give development the tools to see the effects of what they do. Right. Um, uh, and now the responsibility is on development to use that ability wisely. Right. Uh, so instead of uh, focusing on process and automation for self-protection, you're focusing on automation to enable your partners and collaborators in doing this. So that's that's kind of the culture that we want to create. All of the tools, all of the monitoring is in support of that culture. And, uh, you know, and what I'm thinking about when you're talking about the information and not looking at um, those metrics is how do you kind of protect yourself, but or should say mitigate risk, but... Uh, or find the blame, I should say. That's, yeah. what, that's what I was trying to look for, is I think about, if I'm writing an app and I launch it on my uh, on local machine, I'm watching my CPU and my RAM, I just want to know how it's doing. And that's a normal thing that I do when I'm writing code locally, but that we should also maybe look at our entire systems at that same level of, of not, a detachment from what it's, what it's uh, saying, that it's not something that we're looking to protect ourselves from uh, blame or faults, but just how is this system working? And yeah. It, In fact, I would go even farther and say, um, when I'm putting code into production, uh, I'm not just interested in how it's doing on RAM and CPU. <laughs> I'm also looking at the effect on the users. What's the response time distribution? <laughs> uh, what have I done as far as average latency and the 99th percentile latency? 
what have I done in terms of conversion rates and revenue coming into my business? You know, these are things that developers uh, can care about and want to improve. Right. There's a much older idea that says, you know, developers don't care about the business. They don't understand money. They don't, uh, you know, as long as they get to play with their code, they don't care what happens to the business. Um, I found that to be a, a foolish stereotype. Um, and so now you'll have developers who will optimize a chunk of code mm -hmm. in order to improve the response time and get the conversion rate up. Right. So we need to think more about the one I'm have a, a profiler tool that it isn't just looking at bits and bytes, but it's looking at key transactions that yeah, are meaningful absolutely. to to the customer's experience and, and how they're going to interact. With absolutely. Them. So all of these tools exist, mm -hmm. um, but they're normally fragmented. So the operations group will have the system monitoring. Um, uh, you know, maybe you'll have a, a user experience group that's got the uh, real user monitoring system, uh, and then you'll have the marketing group or the analytics group that's got the uh, business significant metrics, they're all being collected different ways. That's why you get 60 tracking pixels on a single web page. Yeah. Uh, and they're all going into different databases. We actually need to bring them all together so I can see a single graph that shows me, um, I don't know, IO saturation, a vertical line where a deployment went out, and the conversion rate all overlaid on the same graph. So I can see, look, that, that went out and crap, the conversion rate went down. Yeah. So here's the next deploy, went back to where it was supposed to be. Yeah, or, oh sure, the CPU or IO went up, but conversions went up higher. Yeah, exactly. And that's going to offset us buying more machines. So exactly. those kinds of, of thoughts can be done instead of just, oh no, we... Right, and so the lean thinkers would say that this is uh, optimizing the whole value chain rather than locally optimizing pieces of the value chain. Right. And, and that's true for the, the actions we take to deliver the software, as well as the value chain of the software executing in production. Yeah, so it's looking at changes in a holistic manner and just seeing how they reflect off of each other and whether or not, if there's an imbalance, whether that actually is okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, when somebody goes to your talk, if there's one thing that I, as a developer or a product manager, you'd like them to take away from that talk and, and go back to their to their companies, to their projects, mm -hmm. and, and try to put some of these new ideas in, into practice, what would you like them to, to take away the most? So I think the number one thing I would like people to take away is you can make these changes yourselves. Right. You don't need permission. You don't need uh, approval from on high. And you especially don't need to buy you know, DevOps in a box right. or buy someone's new tool or old tool that's been relabeled, you know, DevOps edition yeah. or something like that. Um, DevOps is a style of working and it can start at the grassroots. Um, and, you know, if you show some results with it, uh, you'll get more support. Right. And, yeah. and that's just how things go. What was it that uh, I, I think it was, I'm going to say, I think it was Kent Beck that said, don't tell him you're doing Agile. Yeah, because they don't understand what you right. do anyway. <laughs> yeah, because the only answer is no. Right. Right. Yeah. But if you just do something and it works, then the answer is Then they'll come and ask yes. how you did it, and they'll, yeah. they'll want you to replicate it elsewhere. Or at least they'll very much get out of your way. <laughs> True. Oh, well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me. I'm glad to be here. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at youtastic.com.